just to give everybody kind of an overview, first of all, I'd like to be able to ask everybody to make sure you sign your name if this is something that you're interested in. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Um, and then we'll just kind of give a quick review. Now, this isn't something that I do on a regular basis, so bear with me. Um, uh, we've got the um, found, I usually call it the founding households. Um, not everyone is here today, but I'm going to ask Sarah, Catherine, and Jeff to stand up and say hi. hi. And we've been meeting Hello. for about a year. Um, we're missing Lynn because she fell on the ice and isn't, you know, she's doing okay, but she's a little bruised and she said she wasn't going to be able to make it tonight. And um, then there's uh, Bronwyn and Kevin. Um, Kevin said he'd be here, but um, he may just be late. Um, so there are five households, um, three singles and two couples. Um, so it's kind of a nice mix. Um, we're also going to have uh, Susan Hughes here from Orca, and she's going to be filming the meeting so that those people who aren't here will be able to um, see what's going on. I have about 17 people who contacted me to say they, they had other, they had a conflict tonight. Um, <clears throat> I also have put together a 10 question survey on SurveyMonkey, so I'll send around that link. And so anyone who's particularly interested in Silver Maple um, wouldn't mind filling out that survey and sending it in. I'll also try to send around links to other sites that are relevant and some ideas on books. Um, so we are, the survey is only about d just your basic details, you know, how many in your household, you know, what kind of size house do you, would you look at, um, that kind of thing. There's nothing terribly subjective in it. So, <clears throat> um, and a lot of us have these big homes. We are looking to be able to downsize and most everybody here is kind of a subset of the, uh, the main uh, downsizing group. And now we have like 250 people on that group. <clears throat> um, so the aging in place is a little bit more challenging, um, but we'd also like to have our friends and neighbors a little bit closer, especially as we get older because socializing is so critical. Um, so that is how we all kind of got together. Um, we've discussed um, possible locations. We've discussed goals, which I'm going to actually go to the next slide. So these are the goals that our group has focused on. Um, it's like who we are and what do we want in a community. We agreed on a name of Silver Maple. We secured an email address and a URL and had a logo designed. Um, we also discussed the advantages of each kind of a group of both over 55 and intergenerational. So there's that. And we also talked about possible partners. Um, and we've met for about a year. And it's been fluid, but over the past few months, it's been a pretty solid group of the five households. Um, <clears throat> so um, what I'm going to do is just move the slides along and give you a chance to read them. And then um, if I'm going too fast, just let me know. Um, and then I'll have a couple of comments on them. I'm not going to read the slides. You guys can read the slides. So. I have a question. What's possible partners? Excuse me? What do you mean by possible partners? We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, a, in a different kind of a connection, but I mean, in terminology and, and partners. But anyway, so it's really talking about who, who are we. I mean, we're the Woodstock generation, and we do things our way. We don't do things the way our parents have done them. So we want to change the traditional approach to aging, which is often institutional or very separate in our own homes. <clears throat> um, we're looking for people to join us. Um, we're looking for, say, 24 households to move the process forward, but the number can be very fluid. Um, we can start with fewer. We can start with more. Um, and this is kind of. A lot of these images are from um, a two different architects. One is Ross Chapin, who wrote a book called Pocket Neighborhoods. And the other is Ch Chuck Durrett, whose focus is on um, he designs co-housing communities. But we're not saying this is one community or another. We're letting whatever the residents decide is going to be. Um, <clears throat> so in who else? Uh, this is 
having young families nearby could enable an interaction with the Silver Maple members, whether it be mentoring or it could be babysitting, it could be um, changing of um, exchanging um, tasks. Um, <clears throat> Um, it would also enable younger families to live closer to their parents or older relatives. Um, there could be a resident nurse or physical therapist in an adjacent neighborhood. But it would be spear the intergenerational would be spearheaded by someone or a family that would actually be living there. It's not going to be spearheaded by Silver Maple because we have our own stuff to do. Um, but the housing would need to be compatible with the design of Silver Maple, but not identical because intergenerational, they may want two stories, they may want um, a different approach. <clears throat> um, so that's where the two communities would be side by side. So the 800 to 1200 square feet is pretty standard for a small um, I've seen actually 500 square feet and it was really well done so you can really live small and make it very efficient for you and affordable um, so <clears throat> um, the homes that are facing a central green is what pocket neighborhoods and how they're designed so think of you, what you have now as your back porch <coughs> being your front porch so that you're facing friends and people who are walking in the area and having a shared space. And then the back of the house, which is technically the front, is when you would come in with your vehicle and it would be more functional than aesthetic. And this is where most people would spend their time. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> And we're talking about different structures. So these photographs all come from either Chuck's um, designs or Ross Chapin's designs. They tend to be in the northwest of the country, but there are a number of housing communities in, um, in our area that could work. So each house, could, the community could build in different stages and different phases, um, but the legal entity being that of a condominium, which means it's joint ownership of the land and of the exterior of the buildings. The interior would all be owned and managed by the resident. So this way, upkeep on the exteriors is all taken care of. It would be outsourced to contract it out. Um, and that would be decided by the residents. <clears throat> um, so services could be anything. I pulled out a couple of gardens and um, just a really cute house that has its own garden in front. So a lot of the services could would be contracted out, especially on the Silver Maple side. Um, some people could get together and fund dog walking services, or you, know, you could contract with a physical therapist to visit multiple people in the same you know, community. But um, it would still have, you still have your own space, like your own garden, your own little patio in front, your own porch. <clears throat> um, and some of these are just examples of um, pocket neighborhoods. Um, so there's the center greens, which you can see in most of these. Um, and the lower right, that's a very small common house, but a lot of exterior space where people get together and share meals and share events, um, parties, that kind of thing. <clears throat> This. Where are these pictures from, actually? They're from those books. They're, um, they're from all over the country. I don't know exactly where they're all located, but um, you know, I pulled a lot off of their websites, and I have the Pocket Neighborhood book, and I took a workshop with Chuck Durrett so, on senior co-housing. But this isn't necessarily co-housing. This is really up to the residents as to what they actually want it to be. <clears throat> Um, so the layouts, as you can see, these are just different er different um, communities in different parts of the country, but they could be in different um, phases. They could be, and a lot of it's based on the terrain and the size of the land and uh, you know the climate, um, all of that. <clears throat> Um, the common house is something that you usually see in co-housing, but it's really important for socializing, but it's also really important 
for those for everybody who's a resident because you have storage. And people talk about you know bike storage and kayak storage and tire storage and, and whatever. So having a larger house that has these kinds of advantages is really helpful. Um, but it, what it really does is bring people together. And there can be an outdoor, as you can see with these folks. I think that one happens to be, there's one in Boulder, Colorado. That may be them. Um, the drawing on the right <clears throat> is um, like a greenhouse um, that has a shared space as well as actually growing um, things for gardens. Um, <clears throat> where is going to be, who knows? I mean, we've looked at three particular locations. One is particularly good, um, but we are not locked in to one, and this is going to be decided by whoever decides to join the group. Uh, what happened there? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Um, and it will all be determined by a lot of things, you know, what space is needed, um, land can be purchased by the group and a bigger amount of land than that's actually needed and then that other chunk could be sold off to another group and it could be a profit center for the residents of the first group. I mean, it can be just about anything. Um, so transportation, the question came up, um, because we're in this climate and because we are older having an attached garage is is pretty important for when you got groceries you don't want to slide all over the place and you know fall <coughs> and not be able to get your groceries in the house easily so that will be somewhat different um, the intergenerational um, the photo on the lower right is one I took in Massachusetts and the whole carport is nothing but solar panels so it could be very effective on that front I just pulled that a little, looks like a Fiat or something on the, from, uh, from the web, but it could be a small cars with charging stations. Um, <clears throat> and from the standpoint of using other type of transportation, um, I talked with a member of the planning commission um, whose area is transportation, and he said that depending on the number of residents, they could actually create a stop within Silver Maple. So that would be a great advantage. Um, there's also paratransport transit, which is you call in for a, a ride and they're considering um, any seniors who need a ride in the wintertime that you can call and be able to get a ride. <clears throat> so it does have to have a doctor's signature, but you know, that's not that hard to get. <clears throat> but um, golf carts I think would be fun. Maybe not scooters. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, <clears throat> Um, how much is always a question. Montpelier is not particularly cheap to build in, but I did get these um, quotes from a couple of different um, architects and builders. Um, but this, remember, just is the cost of building the house. And the higher the price, the, excuse me, the, the smaller the house, the higher the per square foot because you have to have the same you know, water, sewer, and all that in a small house, the same way you have to have it in a slightly larger house. But it does have um, a number of um, factors that have to be considered. Um, the permitting process, um, all of that, the site work. <clears throat> um, let me see. Now, uh, let's see. There's a possibility of being able to build a four unit um, structure that looks like individual structures. They've done it in Oklahoma, and there's a, it's a four unit, think of a duplex that is two duplexes joined together, and they have each a front porch. So it looks like they're all separate houses, even though they're all joined together. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, so that's possible. <clears throat> and it could reduce the price of the individual homes. Um, so talking about partners, um, because um, the land, the piece, part, the land properties that we're looking at have a lot of acreage, um, it would be advantageous to be able to not control but partner with organizations that would maintain the green space, and you wouldn't have like a 
100 unit development going in because you can't buy the entire piece of land. <clears throat> So I've talked with both the city and the Trust for Public Land, and they're very interested in creating a city park um, on a couple of the properties. So again, this is a public meeting, so we can't get too specific about the locations. Um, also met with the Living Well Group, and it's really worth looking into them. They have such a unique approach to aging, um, both assisted living and memory care. So a quote from them is that um, <clears throat> they have a holistic approach to aging that's vastly different than the approach from traditional institutions. They're considering, I quote, creative collaboration with a focus on healthy aging in community and possibly building an assisted living residential facility based on their philosophy and near Silver Maple. So that would be really helpful. Somebody at the last downsizing meeting said, okay, you know, we'll live, a, we'll live by ourselves up to a point, and then what? Um, so we kind of want to look at the then what. <clears throat> and they're doing some amazing work at Heaton Woods. So they have two other facilities, one in Bristol and then one in Burlington, but they haven't, they've taken them over. They haven't actually built their own. So they have their own really interesting ideas about building um, assisted living center that is focused on community. Um, also met with the um, <clears throat> consultant who was doing the feasibility study for the rec center. And I thought, oh man, if you have a park, you could have a rec center attached to it. Wouldn't that be great? You know, satellite senior center or something. It would be, you know, a real asset. So I just pulled that, that photograph on the right as a sample of a city park somewhere, that's nothing specific. Um, <clears throat> so when? Um, it all depends on uh, involvement, but ideally two or three years for the community um, because of permitting, you know, all of the items that are, are listed there. Um, but then we also have Vermont weather, as a lot of us know, and we're afraid about tonight, but hopefully it won't come until 10 o'clock tonight. We're all back home. Um, <clears throat> so um, some of these, um, some of the, the considerations on the timing, again, it depends on involvement and how many people are interested in this kind of um, approach. Um, decision making, a lot of people ask about. Um, you get a bunch of people who are just residents and you really have decision making a situation to really kind of come up with. But you can see the people like the guy in the back there, he's Chuck Durrett who is the architect for a lot of co-housing units in this country. And he was very involved with the residents of a community who are really deciding where are we going to put the houses? Uh, how big are they going to be? I mean, who am I going to be near? And how are we going to govern? So um, I took a workshop on sociocracy, which is also called dynamic governance. And it was fascinating. Um, it's not consensus and it's not hierarchical. Um, it's bringing people together who may have different opinions, but being able to get them to agree to move forward on the next project on, on a particular project so it gives everybody a voice but it doesn't inhibit something from moving forward <clears throat> um, and then the next steps um, there's the survey that would be really helpful to have input on we're going to ask for a deposit um, we need to we have a an attorney that we feel is going to be um, a really great person to work with um, I have spoke with landowners, um, so there's, there's a lot that's been going on. Um, so I think we are ready to make the next steps. For those people who are really interested in something like this, and a public, it would not be a public meeting, it would be only for those people who said, okay, this looks good to me, <clears throat> um, let's see how far we can go with this. Um, that will be on December 8th at the, in City Hall. So um, I appreciate everybody being here and putting up with my lack of um, <laughs> experience in doing this kind of thing. Um, but are there any questions? And I should say Kevin is here now too, so we have four of our, our households represented. Um, if anybody has any questions, 
this would be a great time. Did you say, can we look at any of the properties yet that are being considered? Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to join the group, the, the first deposit would be refundable. Um, but because, again, this is public, I don't think it's a good idea to kind of divulge where we've been looking. Um, so that we can certainly sit around and discuss at the next meeting. Um, I've walked a bunch of a few different areas, some, and they do change, you know. One we were looking at, it's like, okay, well, somebody bought that, and they're putting two houses on it, like 10 acres, 12 acres, what? <laughs> so, you know, it goes. You gonna go? What's that? A front? No, a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> so people can see it. Oh. <laughs> anyway, I had to stand here because I had to get the clicker close to the computer. So, thanks. Um, so, are you heading out? No. Are you thinking, oh, okay. okay. Thanks. Or so, in other words, before the next meeting on December 8th, you want a commitment with a uh, refundable deposit? At the next meeting, not before the next meeting. So, oh, for those, the, excuse me? You mean at the next meeting? Yeah, so okay. if those people who are really interested in being part of Silver Maple and taking the next steps, we would be asking for a $100 deposit. We haven't formed the LLC yet, but that's next on the list. Um, <clears throat> we will have a board, but that's fluid as well. So we have just been meeting as a group for the past year. Yeah? I, no, I understand that you can't tell us about the specific uh, properties, but you probably could tell us that these are going to be outside of the central downtown area, correct? Yeah, because there's acreage, and there isn't any acreage in the downtown um, area. But it's, um, it's a community, so if you're thinking of a community within a community, but everything we've looked at is within Montpelier city limits. And part of the consideration is access to um, services like sewer, water, because that changes the price of, of a home significantly. I've talked to people, there's a small co-housing group um, in Middle, I think Middlesex or East Montpelier um, that has six homes and she told me about what the struggle was to get a septic and a well drilled and it was a really a big headache. It took them more money than they really wanted to spend on it. <clears throat> so that's kind of why we're looking at city services. There was a time frame before two to three years. Did you mean that uh, two or three years to first get uh, the group organized and then no, two to three years to be built, hopefully. You know, a year to do the planning and all the requirements of, the, of that, and then the, uh, a year to do building. And you have to take into consideration seasons and, you know, cities, what, you know, the timing for all the permitting and all of that. So what we like to do is work with someone who has experience in that to be able to make it happen. Now, whether that's a project manager, whether that's, you know, the builder who has a general contractor or whatever, because none of us really have deep experience in this. <clears throat> okay. So if you're organized enough to start the project, can you estimate about what year it would be finished? Well, it'd be great to do it by 2020. So I'm looking at two years. I mean, none of us are getting any younger. So pushing this off for five years is not gonna happen. You know, yeah, and I got that. involved in doing this because sometimes if you want something, you got to go in there and do it yourself. That so that's that kind that. of where I came from. <laughs> I'm not a builder. I'm not a realtor. I don't have any background in that. But so Meredith. No, he's trying to oh. say something more. Oh, isn't that kind of ambitious? Or I mean, why not? That in two years, in less than two years, you can have the whole thing. Well, it depends place. on the number of people who want to be involved. And according to the builders and people we've talked to, it's about a two-year process. Yes, it can be longer than that, depending on if you run into roadblocks, but that would be two years. And we got a timeline from an architect and a builder um, that that's pretty much what it was. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, you, if you, you're skeptical about that, but it, Two years is, seems to be what, the, and it all depends on when you start the process too, because you can't start building in December. You know, you, you well, gotta exactly start. What I mean. So you gotta start, but you can do all the backup. You can do the, the planning and the permitting and the, all of that, because a lot of that's available online and through maps and the rest of it. 
you know, chances are getting really going on this is probably not happening till spring because we have a lot of organizing to do as a group. How do the contractors work? Let me get Meredith first because Meredith was. Um, does that uh, per square foot um, price, does that include like the road that you'd have to put in and that kind of no. thing? No, it only includes the house. Uh, only includes the house. And there was a similar, I only saw one other company that came in a little bit lower than that, but it really depends on how much management there is of the process. So the higher the price, the more involvement of the management of the process, which also means you don't have to do as much of it and hire an outside person. So it's, it's kind of fluid on that. Every, there's, I've talked to three different organizations, and they all kind of work a little differently. Um, <clears throat> but then, again, if you were able, if you're able to have the city want to do a park someplace, they would already have access roads. Because I got to build it for a park, and if we're going to adjacent to a park, you know, it might be a little easier. So it doesn't include the land, then, and it doesn't include the contract. And it wouldn't include the land. And it really depends upon um, what size acreage. Some of these pocket neighborhoods are built in cities, so that you have very little acreage. Some of them that I went to Massachusetts, they were on 20 acres. So it really depends upon what the what the group wants, if they want, if people want a lot of green space and open space, then you make a greater commitment to a more land than you would actually build on. And the zoning is kind of all over, but around the roof is around R9000 and uh, within Montpelier around the periphery. <clears throat> so some of it is zoned that makes it very challenging. So it really depends on the property you're looking at. Acreage, if you're looking at, really depends on, on how many people buy in, right? Um, yeah, and then what people want, you know. So if we, if there are 12 people, and say, okay, everybody would like to have a lot of green space, you know, maybe it's an acre a house, even though that's not required. It, it really is up to the residents as to who, how this comes together, and we want half an acre. Do you want 9,000 square feet? Um, you know, but okay. we were looking at the, the, the city did um, zoning as a cottage cluster in various parts of the city so that you can have double the density um, for that particular zoning area. Right. Right. That. <clears throat> so that's possible. And I'm just learning all this stuff, so bear with me. I think a lot of people here know more than I do about it. I'm just trying to move it along. <laughs> Joan. So would um, all have, could different cottages have different amounts of land? Um, not normally. No. Normally, pretty much everybody has the same amount of land because then that only that is fair, mm -hmm. and then the upkeep is the same for every home. Whether you have an 800 square foot home, you might have a little bit more land just mm -hmm. from the standpoint of square footage. Mm -hmm. But other than that, not normally. So you don't even have a rough idea of what the additional costs would be. What um, for what? Outside of the house itself. Um, yeah, actually, Jay was supposed to be here tonight, yeah. and he didn't come. <laughs> Jay said, I'll come get the information. But um, really, it's really Catherine? site dependent. Yeah. Um, you know, there's linear, there's cost for linear foot um, that for design estimates, engineering design estimates. I'll be near you because this is the mic. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> for design estimates. But it really depends on the site, totally on the site. Yeah, I mean, there's terrain issues all over Montpelier, yeah. as you can well know. And um, Fran? So there, there are really at least three different sets of costs, right? There's one for the building itself, which you had up there, an estimate of the range per square foot. Then there are the sort of basic structural costs at the beginning, the land and the roads. It's like the, the site work. Site yeah. work and utilities. And then once that's all done, then there'll be condominium costs of some sort to maintain the yards but that's and a, plow. Yeah, but that's usually a monthly charge, like a, a condo right. maintenance yeah. fee. That's pretty standard. Yeah, right. But that that will take mm -hmm. care of the exterior right. grounds and the exterior of the building. Right. If this were to move forward mm -hmm. in some way, the LLC that you create, would that be the purchaser of the land? 
Well, <laughs> that could be they could be the. They could be the um, and, then was, and then he was, and then to buy in, he would reimburse some part of the cost of that land in some way. Um, yeah, what the um, attorney said that you want to do a offer to purchase to the landowner, and then the deposits that come in from that are retained in an LLC account. But once you finish the building, that LLC is dissolved because then everybody has part of the condominium organization. So it's yeah. basically for building. <coughs> it's, I think of kind of like a construction loan, and it's grad, it changes all the time based on you know where you are in the process. I was interested in how how you finance the the initial um, purchase of the of the land. Yeah. Well, some it depends on whether the land can be subdivided. So that's one reason for talking with the city and various other potential partners because if the land can be subdivided, you, can, you have to make a decision as to what you want. Do you want 10 acres? Do you want 20 acres? Do you want five acres? What does the group want? What size community? What amount of green space do people want? And when that is decided, then you can go to the landowner and say, would you like to subdivide X property into 10 acres or whatever. So then you would get a price from the landowner and then you would split that up among the residents. So, but say you have, say you have 12 households, <clears throat> but eventually you'd like to see 24. So you're gonna purchase enough land to be able to enable another 12 homes and you can make that consideration as to whether you buy that and then turn around and sell it or whether you want to keep it, and I don't know. That's something to be decided. I know, Leslie, you had a No, I was just too. wondering about the building of the houses, how that, because they have to be the same, right? Well, they could be similar. I mean, if uh, you look at some of the websites for either co-housing or pocket communities or intentional communities, um, they're similar, but they're not identical. Um, it can be various differences in color, and some of the ones you can kind of see, they're a little similar. But when you have homes that are 800, 1,200 square feet, they're single level, they're on a front porch, they're going to look a little alike. You know, you know, you might want purple, and somebody else might want teal, but that's okay. <laughs> what actually is you know? the difference between co-housing and this? There isn't a whole lot of difference. Um, there's intentional communities, which is a little bit less involved. There's co-housing, which is very involved. And then there's um, just these pocket neighborhoods, which are really more just designed around a green. It is not necessarily involving cooperation. But if we're talking about building community and a new approach to aging, that's really involvement. And I think. The people I've talked who would really like to be involved with each other, you know, have a neighbor, have a friend, you know, really establish a connection. Yeah, um, getting back to the question of it, it being completed by whatever time you're talking about, 2020, 2021, let's say, um, when you look at the models, when you've gone to see the models, uh, is it about um, one architect? and one builder building all these homes? Or is it one architect and many, many builders building various <coughs> homes? Because it seems to me that if you had one builder building all these homes, it, it's hard to visualize it all being done by 2020. Well, 2020. it depends on the builder. Yeah. Um, it depends on how big the builder is. I mean, if you're using a small builder who usually does one of homes, that could be challenging. Mm -hmm. But if you're using a builder, um, I met with SD Ireland um, initially. I have a connection with them through a little nonprofit cancer research fund thing. And, um, you know, they build 100 homes at the same time, you know, so they're a different animal. They don't want to do here because it's too far away. Is the idea of one architect, though? <clears throat> well, if you use one architect, you're going to have efficiencies of scale so that you're going to be able to have, say, the architect's going to design like three different floor plans or four different floor plans. You get another architect and they're going to want to charge, okay, how are you going to bring that together? So I think sticking with, with one is probably the way to go. Are there, 
Would there be bylaws regarding the use of, suppose somebody built one and then moved to a different situation, can they rent that? And if they can, are, are, are the rent, the people who are allowed to rent or to buy one if, if they decide to sell? limited to certain ages or certain? Well, that's all to be decided by the residents, but I have a cousin who lives in Florida and they live in an over 55 community. I asked her that question and she said, yeah, we've got rules that say you can rent it for six months and then it has to go to an over 55 couple after that. Um, there's a lot of different, this is where it comes down to operating plans and designing that. Yeah. Carrie, I, I I know a fair amount about um, co-housing, and there are three sets of issues that you've sort of each time said, well, that's to be decided. <laughs> that's one of the issues, how decisions are made. Right. And you referred to a, a particular mm -hmm. approach, which you may or may not take, because you say, well, that's for the, um, the people who are doing this to decide whether that's way we're going to decide, which is a little, a little <laughs> the other, the other two big issues besides the selling one is aging out. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a uh, non-intergenerational um, situation, you will have people who are going to age out or who are going to go to assisted living, die, etc. And then the idea of the succession Mm -hmm. because they're going to leave their homes to their heirs who may be their grandchildren. So th 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 there's some pretty big issues that pretty soon after your next meeting, you're going to need to right. get to that. The how are you going to make decisions, especially those big ones? And the third issue is the what you call cooperating. The big difference between co-housing and the other two is the amount of cooperative activity, which includes of actually being on, on boards, et cetera, mm -hmm. but it also includes community gardens and yep. uh, uh, working on the exterior of buildings, et cetera. And again, one of the problems with uh, co-housing uh, where, where cooperation is a big thing is people getting older and not being able to do it. And what happens then is that the younger of the old people end up with a, the burden of doing okay. almost all the work. Well, let me, let me stop you there. Um, so I went to, um, <laughs> um, when I went down to Massachusetts to do this workshop, it was a three-day uh, co-housing like a conference. And I figured, uh, alma mater is UMass, I might as well go down and <laughs> see what's going on down there anyway. Um, and so they have one that's Pioneer Valley Co-Housing. It's been around for over 20 years, and they are aging out. Um, so they're trying to figure that out. The houses are great. They're not suitable for aging in place. They've got stairs. They've got angled walkways. Uh, they don't have garages. They've got parking lots. Um, so the group, because there's now, I think only two younger families in there now, they're talking about buying land across the street and building a senior co-housing community so that they can go over there and then put the houses up for sale for younger families. So part of that thinking of having intergenerational and then having seen it's over 55 and then hopefully having, you know, an assisted living that's quite a different approach to it um, would be ideal because at some point in time, yes, you're going to be moving on. But then if you have an intergenerational, their kids grow up, they go off, they go to college, they go wherever. And then they kind of say, OK, well, I, there's a home that's free over here in the Silver Maple. Why don't I just come over here? And they don't really need to leave that immediate area. But it's enough to deal with you know, just Silver Maple, let alone trying to manage an intergenerational. Um, they also um, <clears throat> have found that the workload is quite different. So I took a, a day-long workshop in only senior co-housing. And it's a very different approach. So besides the garages up in the Northeast, you also have um, uh, contracted out work like plowing and shoveling and mowing. And while that is decided by the group, it's also a lot more common in a, in a senior co-housing arrangement. So I don't really, 
see there's a huge problem with that. But, you know, yeah, people will go through transitions and they have different agreements. So if your house, you move on to assisted living and then you have a home, you offer it to an intergenerational. It would only make sense if they're nearby and they don't have kids and they're over 55. Um, they could come in and take over your home. I mean, you're going to leave it to them anyway, probably. And then you can just go from, <clears throat> um, and if you don't have someone and somebody in the intergenerational doesn't want to get the house, then it goes on the open market. Phil? What was your group's thinking about why they wanted to have it over 55 instead of Silver Maple being intergenerational? Sarah. Where's Sarah? <laughs> Uh, I, we we talked. We, we really had a lot of discussions about this. So I I was following up on something you had said at one of our initial meetings, right. which was that in communities which are intergenerational, the needs of the children in the community tend to drive the community decisions. That's right. And I would like to be in a community where the needs of seniors drive the decisions. Right. And this is why the other reason we were considering not having it all one or the other, because kids do drive the decisions in, in, a, in a young family's um, community, which it should, as it should be. Um, and then the over 55, you have a lot different needs, a lot, it's, it's a whole different um, set of requirements and, and needs. That was the reasoning. But if they were adjacent, well, you know, it wouldn't be that they wouldn't be that far away, and you could have a choice. But the intergenerational would probably not be single level. Um, they may be a little bit high, a little bit more. If so, the family has three kids, they might need three bedrooms, not two bedrooms. So there would be different needs for the structures as well. And this is all just kind of thinking, you know, a lot of this will come together as people um, have discussions. Could you go so. back up on the screen what was included or and not included? Just go back one or two frames. <clears throat> Let me see where's my ears. So it stopped me when you... Yes. How much? One, yes. So can you estimate what the average square footage is? 800 to 1,200 square feet. That's, that is the general, that's a round figure. That isn't written in stone. That's just to put us on the, so give us call, call them 1,000 square feet at $200 a square foot. It's $200,000 structure. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to invest close to $100,000 in infrastructure mm -hmm. per structure. You're probably talking about a $300,000 purchase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is why thinking about having, you know, double duplex, I don't know, a quadplex, I guess, um, homes joined together, it would be a lot less expensive and it could look great. So if there is a consideration of people really needing to have a less expensive home, then that's a possibility because they're certainly going to be a lot cheaper because you're pouring one foundation. You're not doing four separate ones. And so the utilities <coughs> then serve all of them or is What's a that? way to... Is there a way to save costs on utilities because of that, with different meters or something, I, um, I imagine? Possibly. I mean, I think each one would have to have its own metering. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. But we're mostly just talking, you know, efficiencies of scale with the, with the building. And I'm just assuming, because I just saw that the other day, I was like, oh, that's pretty interesting. So, I don't know. There's, there's research to be done. That's why it needs to be involved. Uh, there is. <clears throat> One other consideration that links to what the gentleman back here was saying about, um, you know, people are going to die and they're going to be in open houses. The one thing that uh, we've learned, you guys are Just the speak representative, up so representative of this, is um, our generation has very few options in Montpelier, period. They don't exist. And... There are a heck of a lot of other people that are younger than us that are going to be facing the same situation. So I'm less concerned about, you know, dying at 80 and have nobody to step into a house. There are going to be plenty of people who are interested in the same sort of physical space and community. Um, the challenge around cost has to do with how many households want to buy in. It's not going to happen with six. 
It's just because the cost of the infrastructure is prohibitive for six households. 12 is sort of the minimum. It's much better to share those infrastructure costs across, let's say, 24 households than 12. It's going to be a lot less expensive. And if some of the conversations that, <coughs> excuse me, Carrie has been having with city and others about what's possible, the land costs uh, could also be far less than if you were going to do this on your own. So there are opportunities here that exist within the city, but in order to make it work, there's, there's this, at least 12 households have to be part of this. And that means more than just our talking to each other. It means at some point, people are willing to put money on the table for some of the things that she described and are willing to commit to making this organization, whatever that means, uh, work. Whatever the process for making decisions and so forth, each of those has to be determined. Um, and that's, and you guys are sort of the, the first group, other than the five households that have been meeting, to really have an opportunity to say yay or nay, I want to be part of this, or I want to explore this, I'm serious about it. Um, it won't happen with five households. Yeah. And the other reason is because if, if it's a resident-driven initiative, you can design it. You can say yay or nay to a design, to a floor plan, to a location, to it's about anything. But if a builder comes in, knows he's got a market, they'll build what they want, and they'll make a 20% profit on it, and then you've got to take it or leave it. I mean, and I've looked at some of the take it or leave it's, and, and frankly, it, it's not where I'd like to be. I'd like to have a little bit more control over, I want to age where it's beautiful. You know, I want to look out and see a field. You know, I want to be able to see friends and go next door and not have to slip on the ice and, you know. <laughs> I have rails that can get one, price, one house to the other, but. <laughs> um, How long has the five, the, have the five households already been meeting? We've been meeting for a year, um, but we've had people in and out. So our group that has been the five, I'd say we've met Pretty much ours, but maybe Sarah's a secretary, so we've been meeting maybe for about five months, just the five of us. <clears throat> we've had all kinds of conversations. Who are we? Do we want to be co-housing? Do we want to be intergenerational? Do we want to be senior? What do we want to be? And so it's a lot of conversation, and then a decision making comes. Like, okay, we'll elect the board, and what's our next step? And the next step is to have a meeting and see who else is interested in becoming involved and then go from there. Um, so there will be escalating investments. And we're assuming that this is going to be um, pretty much both self-financed and you know, supplementally financed, because most of us have old homes that we can't really necessarily easily age in place. We'll partner with a bank or a financial institution to get involved. Um, and then we'll go from there. But market rate is about where we are because the affordable bill, as designated by the state, is maxed out in Montpelier. Because I've talked to, you know, two entities who said, you know, don't use my name, but we're maxed out on affordable housing with French Block, with the Christchurch, and with Taylor Street. So that's where we're talking market rate. But market rate doesn't mean, you know, a half a million dollar house either. I mean, it's Montpelier, and what the builders have said that some of them that don't want to build here is because you can, the building costs are just as expensive as they are in Burlington, but you can get half the amount of money for them. You know, so income levels in Montpelier aren't what they are in Burlington. But we have an aging population, and we really need to consider what are our options. Our options are either staying in our homes, and while our house is totally unsuitable, um, our neighborhood's changed. People have moved away, you know, our, our next door neighbor turned into a rental, and the house behind us is no one. No, uh. So it, it really, you know, you can be part of a neighborhood that helps each other out, you know, basically. We're, you know, there's a villages model that I think some of you who went to vote, saw the table. 
Um, I'm going to send around. I do the email for the Montpelier Downsizing Group, so I'll be sending out their information. But you can age in place here, and they can be part of villages. But then you have, a gr you have your immediate community as well as having the community of Montpelier. So that's kind of where we're thinking. Um, does anybody else have any questions or suggestions? Yes, sir? Uh, uh, I guess the thing that will affect the timeline more than anything else is how long you have to talk about it and get to <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, and if you want to have this done by 2020, you have to have the primary decisions of the structure done in six months from now. That's doable. It is doable yeah. if people agree that they're going to do that. Yeah. Right. Okay? So my, my first comment is I'll put $100 in. No problem. It's not enough. Right. Well, okay. I have to say the initial recommendations. I, does, does anybody here know Joe, um, John Ryan? Yes. Um, so we've been working with John, and some of us met at his um, Aging Successful Ace Salons. So um, John, I had a long conversation. He says, well, you need to get deposit initial deposit of $1,500. So we passed it around to our group, and it was like, this is too much. So we have to kind of look at that. And then he said, then you need to increase it by $5,000 so that you can actually make something happen. You can actually exactly right. buy the land. You can actually do something. Because if, you're, if people need to make a $300,000 investment, that's a made up number. But it's not going to be, it's not off by an order of magnitude. If, you, if people are going to, if want to be part of this, are going to make a, have to make a $300,000 investment. Putting in $100 now to have a vote in everything is going to have too many people who really aren't going to follow through or be interested. He's right. We need $1,500 on this, and he's put $5,000 at stage two. Okay. Non-refundable. Non-refundable. And that will separate whether you really have a dozen people who are willing to buy, build houses or whether you've got 50 people trying to make decisions for the 12 who eventually will. And that will not get done in two years. Yeah. I, I think that you got a good point there. There's, I would add one other <clears throat> comment to what Tim just said. Um, that Carrie has been very modest about what, how she described her involvement. Um, she's been, except, and even while she was getting a rehab for her knee replacement, she's had her foot on the accelerator for more than a year. And it's also clear that she is not the sole driver. This is not a one person show. So in addition to 1500 bucks, you're also putting yourself into the mix in terms of time, energy, ideas, a willingness to collaborate with people who maybe we don't all know and create a community. That's not easy to do. But what's not gonna happen is she's not going to be the person to be the driver, um, not without a lot of help. And part of this is also you're making a commitment of time and energy and uh, yourself in addition to the money. The money is, is very, rep in my opinion, it's very representative of, of a commitment. Well, I just want to say something about this, uh, the, the, the fees, this initial fee. Um, and I, I would disagree with you. I would think I think that there might be uh, some real um, advantage to a uh, hundred dollar, two hundred dollar, whatever it is, and, and to begin to get a, a larger conversation going. And then when you up it, you'll have the the, um, the benefit of a lot of a lot of ideas from a lot of people, and a lot of people may change their minds, not change their minds. But if you if you if, you know, cap it at, or if the initial thing is is a lot, maybe five thousand or something. I think you you will whittle it down, and people don't know each other, and it's. It, I, I think that that you know the initial a smaller amount could be very helpful in in igniting some some real uh, discussion. It depends which way you depends which way you look at it. It's interesting. For instance. Um, on one end, you have the people, whoever they are, that are going to say, okay, we're off and running 2020, 2021. Here we are, we're putting in money, and let's get to it. 
and I think on the, as opposed to let's say people are putting in a hundred, just for instance, who okay now are we going to then repeat what these folks have done for a year, and where are we going to be a year from now? It's then 2000, the end of 2019. It all depends what what the timing of it is, you know. Well, and a really big consideration here, I think, is your so-called partners. Right. You know, if you're going to get the city involved, that's a whole other thing. But then that's also a subdivision. So we would, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, you're not going to have an undesirable, you know, adjacent you community, well, not we call it a community, but what's a hotel or whatever it is, um, at your location. And that was the whole point of trying to get the city involved because, um, and I have to, in full disclosure, I met with the Parks Commission on Tuesday night and they're thrilled. <laughs> so, what's that? And they're thrilled. I met with the Parks Commission to kind of propose an idea for a park in a particular location and um, in a city park and, and they just they say, oh, this is great. Why haven't we seen this before kind of thing. They have no money. They have no ability to manage a park. They have no, no financing. They have no walk. They don't have enough people. I mean, I, oh, no. I, I was told that. We just get <laughs> you. You have to have their approval. There is there is so much ability. city land in town that is not taken care of. The idea of the city taking on more public land is it's not public land. No it's private. Money and they can't take, you know, the city doesn't take, take care of what it owns at this point. Well, um, the discussions of whether or not the city's in a position to do anything financially is an important conversation, but that's not what this is about. <coughs> There's an opportunity to create um, a, 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 an over 55 community with adjacent city owned park land. What that means in terms of costs is a big question mark right now for everybody, yeah. but they're interested. But there's also, and also I'm not that knowledgeable about who do you go to first and who answers, who is responsible and all of that. But um, the, the land that we've seen is not currently managed by anybody. The landowner, nobody, you know, maybe people walk on it, but there's, there's not any management of it per se. Are you talking about some kind of city City no. Land? no, no, just the land private. Yeah. No, I, I just want to just agree with this gentleman here about about the amount of money that you need to get going. And I think you've made a very good point. I, I saw a co-housing community. Just gonna, I want to add one thing that got a lot of money up front because you need that in order to move forward. Not just you need the money for the banks. You need the money for the commitment. You don't want to have people who are just chipping in and sort of lurking. <laughs> um, and uh, the, 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 the issue is, when do you make that decision? Yeah. You tentatively said it'll be at the next meeting, at least for 100. That doesn't mean that that's really your commitment. But very quickly, you do need to call for real commitment, real money. Right. But let me just suggest, the time to do that is when you are really about 95% confident about the land that you're going to buy. Right. Because the one that I, that I actually put in my $100 to lurk, um, <laughs> they ended up not getting the property that they thought they were going to get. Yeah. 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 And so the people who put in a yeah. lot of money were screwed. Yeah. So, so that, you have that, to two, two. getting the getting the property, or being right. damn sure you're going to get the property, is the point where people really should, at that point, put up the real serious money. But then there are the imponderables. Uh, the example that I'm going back to is the one a year or two ago, which was up at the old Necky building on the top of Main Street. And we were really, really very, very interested in that. And there was all kinds of discussion about, wow, pocket community up there. And I think Davis came in from Burlington, well-known developer. Jeff Nick. I think Jay was Jeff involved. Nick. Jay Ansel was involved. Oh, Jeff Nick. Jeff Nick and, was, and, yeah. Well, then what started to happen were the imponderables, meaning the adjoining landowners, 
started to get all upset about all kinds of issues, uh, about adverse possession and you name it. And so there are all these sort of unpredictable parts of any part, and, and that happened to be that example, but you can take any example in our community, and you can bet that lurking around the corner is going to be somebody or somebody who, by the way, they're then going to meet. That's why we need you. We're going to use your legal ability. I don't know about legal. I don't know about legal. Well, to echo Alan, too, yeah. is that um, that was the other, re the other reasoning for approaching the city about a park. So you don't have the NIMBY. When you have a city park nearby, you know, in a neighborhood that hasn't had much going on. So that was part of the other thinking. Um, and when you have a small community of over 55, I'm like, really? You know, we're going to be really creating a lot of trouble, right? Find NIMBY. <laughs> oh, not in my backyard. <laughs> Do you have a tentative site now that you're? Um, I don't, I can't really be specific oh, here. Okay. Um, but um, there's one that's in that's particularly good. Um, so I've talked with a landowner been a number of times, and he's really open. So we'll see. And I've talked to other landowners too. So. Can we be talking about the site at this? Yes. Meeting? Yeah. Because so it will be a it will be. It will be a closed meeting, not in the bridge. You're right, right. <laughs> <laughs> the, ser the serious comment, though, is I think it probably makes sense to have a low number to get people yeah. to that meeting and to hear more and then and then after that you, you go up from the there there's yeah. a higher yeah. number and, and, and it might be that you have you know to sit in and listen and offer some ideas a hundred dollars buys you that seat yeah. Yeah. but it doesn't buy you a vote yeah. well that's a good point sit. there's a real there's a real estate development saying that, that is, I've learned is so true time kills all deals Okay? And if you, if you mess around because you can't get the decisions, you'll lose the opportunities that you have. Yep. Um, and, and, and again, the time frame, you're, you're, this gentleman's right, the time frame is very aggressive, but it's only doable if you can make decisions when you have to make decisions, compromise when you need to compromise. Yep. And that's going to take people who are committed to the concept and committed to taking a risk because, Jeff, as you said, what's the alternatives if you want to live in Montpelier? Okay. I'm going to throw out one other point, too, while we're at it. <laughs> as I'm observing this, for instance, the five people were meeting for a year, right? And the five people were shuffling around and making their decisions, and five might have been interesting, right? Well, now you've got the 100 people putting in, call it all of a sudden 40, 45, 50, exponentially more complicated. So what I would advise is a really excellent facilitator who can help with where are we going and what are we doing. Well, but but it's important though. No, let me just throw in the, yeah. Um, yeah. I met with two facilitators in Massachusetts. One of them is almost free because she's looking at time because she's so in, interested in this and so involved in it. And there is another guy there who would probably charge a little bit more, but he does the most fabulous workshop on, on um, uh, sociocracy that really conveyed how it works. Um, so yes, you're gonna need that. And so some of these deposits, and as they gradually would increase, are educational. I mean, they're to kind of bring us together to kind of say, oh, so that's how it works. And you know, why start reinventing the wheel when you already have people who know how the wheel is done, you know? Um, so yes, that's possible. And they're, they're not an arm and a leg. And there's actually somebody in town who just moved into town um, who does have a big background in sociocracy. So. <clears throat> um, but this is a great discussion. I mean, I really appreciate everybody's input on this and questions and involvement. And I certainly hope we're able to um, bring a, a core group together to make this happen. So I guess it's kind of the time to, for hand raising. Who would really be interested in coming to that December 8th meeting? Great, we were looking for it. <clears throat> oh, thank you. <laughs> so that would be great. Um, okay, it's $100 per household. 
that's the easiest way to, you know, to explain it. Thank you, Alan. Um, and, and really getting people involved who have a lot of expertise. Um, I'm just trying to, like I say, just move it along. I'm not a, Thank you. Um, <laughs> no expert on it now, on most of this. And I haven't lived in Montpelier much. I mean, I moved in 20, 2002, but I was on the road a third of the time for work for, you know, until like 2013, you know. So I just haven't, I'm now starting to know people. And so I apologize if I don't know everybody that I should know on this front. But thanks, everybody. On, on your oh, way out, if good question. you have not I'll ask the lawyer. signed, <laughs> well, not signed the uh, sheet here, please do that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the only the way, way I can be in touch with you. Is this made to the order of the Jeff Roberts Italian trip? Eh. Uh, for you, uh, Alan, it just went up. No, I mean, what it will be is just if you bring a check, um, I, Jeff, and I can't pronounce his last name, it's a uh, it's a long Polish name. He lives in Moortown, but the company is Gravel and Shea, who he works for. Um, and he has particular experience in this field. And I talked with him, and he gave me some great advice over the phone, no charge. So um, I think he's a really good, a good choice. Um, so he, would, he said, yeah, I can, I can probably take the, you know, whatever funds you get and put it open in a bank account for the, with the firm yeah. and do it. <laughs> Well, the LLC, we would need to file. <clears throat> We're, we'll need a little advice on that, because some people have said you need this before you need that, and then somebody says you need that before you need this. That's why I hire a lawyer. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody.